Good day everyone and welcome to day 232, turn 232 of your daily Civ 7 news update. We have so much news today, I'm going to start this off by talking about something wild that I don't think I've seen anyone else talking about yet. Uh, this is a screenshot from the gameplay live stream, and can you see it? Uh, this little almost achievement-like notification popped up when Kyle founded a city as Rome. It says, challenge complete, play game 2 and seems to reward 25 XP. Now, unless I missed where this XP comes into play, I think they're actually going to be doing some kind of meta progression in Civ 7. Uh, if we look over on the Steam page, they also state that you can unlock progression bonuses for your leaders across multiple gameplay sessions. This gives me a little bit of pause. I sincerely hope that stuff like unique abilities, units, buildings, all that aren't locked behind progression. Uh, you know, stuff like play three games as Rome to unlock the Legion, or place five districts on rivers as Egypt to gain your production bonus towards the pyramids. That does not sound good. Um, I really hope that's not the path they're going down. Best case scenario, this could be something like if you play a certain amount of games as Rome, you could unlock alternate outfits for Augustus, like we see for Napoleon. I don't think that would be too egregious, but Fraxis, if you see this, I think you should really clarify what the go is here, because this has potential to be really bad, or a reasonably interesting addition. On to everything else, uh, get ready for a feature length special news report today. So start off, uh, Eurekas have been replaced in a sense with these narrative events. Um, I share Potato McWhiskey's pessimism around these events slightly in that after reading them two or three times, realistically I'm eventually just going to completely ignore the, the narrative of what's going on and pick the best choice every time, completely dis disregarding what they're going for there, but oh well. Um, uh, Moria, the Moria theme is great. Uh, this was shown off in the diplomacy uh, setting. It's sort of like a Buddhist chant, um, and the history behind Ashoka I thought was really cool as well. Uh, but okay, also, what has happened to those leader backgrounds? Um, are they not quite ready yet? Also, what are these leader portraits? This is. This is the uni group after you finished the presentation that you crammed the whole night before and it was terrible, and you all know it was terrible, the tutor knows it was terrible, but you're all kind of standing there like, eh. That's, that's a shocker. Um, anyway, moving on, some clarification around towns. So settlers create towns, and any production that they collect turns into gold. They can only purchase units and certain buildings, uh, they can't produce anything, and you can also send the food from these towns to other cities. Uh, towns all naturally start out as a growing town. This gives it the trait that growth is increased by 50%. Once it reaches 7 population, you can pick a town focus, as shown here. Uh, so you can keep the growth focus. You can become a fort town, providing plus 5 healing to units and plus 25 health to walls in this town. Farming towns provide plus 1 food on farms, pastures, plantations, and fishing boats. Mining towns provide plus 1 production on camps, woodcutters, clay pits, mines, and quarries. Trade outposts provide plus two happiness to each resource tile in the town and give plus five range to your trade routes. Uh, note that you are stuck with this focus until the next stage, unless you swap back to the default growing town focus. Uh, they showcased off this military milestone. Uh, so these milestones are how you upgrade your leader. Uh, they give you legacy points to spend in the age transition. Uh, reaching the end of these and achieving a golden age for that path has some really interesting effects. Uh, these aren't necessarily new, but I'll go over them here. Uh, so for culture, your amphitheaters become Golden Age amphitheaters, retaining their base yields, adjacency bonuses, and effects in the next age. Science is the same, but for your academies. The military path creates you an infantry unit in each settlement, which seems extremely strong. Uh, and the most interesting one here is the economic Golden Age. Uh, so in antiquity, it's called the Silk Roads Golden Age, and that effect is that all of your cities from the previous age remain cities, which also has some very interesting implications. Uh, the settlement limit was discussed, so this is a soft cap, to be clear. Uh, you can go over it, but for every settlement that you exceed that limit, you receive a minus 5 happiness penalty to all other settlements. So there is an incentive to stay under, but it doesn't seem overly punishing to go over it, unless the effects of unhappiness are really dire. Uh, I don't think they've explained happiness in detail, so I'll have to wait and see there. Uh, I also don't think they mentioned if there's a benefit to going the other way and being way under the limit, so more detail required. As for specialists, um, from what I saw, you can play specialists in urban districts. They provide a base of two science, two culture, at a cost of two food and two happiness. 
Now, they also implied that they boost the adjacency bonus on districts somehow, but they didn't really elaborate. Um, but this is how you would enhance your yields beyond just going wider and wider, so not too dissimilar really to how specialists have worked in previous civs. So you can attack army commanders directly, uh, and doing this will unpack the units into nearby adjacent tiles with the units themselves coming out with reduced health. Uh, I feel this will make surprise wars quite strong if you're able to quickly get in and assassinate an enemy's commander. Uh, and on the, the flip side, you'll always want to keep your army commanders safe and provide a it, this provides a tangible downside to just having all your units bunched up inside the commander all the time, as that leaves the commander itself vulnerable to being attacked. Now let's get to the juicy stuff. So the reason why we all tuned in, age transitions. Uh, so this screen here showcases the rewards you earned over the past age, the legacy points you earned on those reward parts we talked about earlier. Uh, what I liked about the top here is that you can see the other tabs, uh, so age rankings, hopefully showing a few stats around how you did in that age compared to other players. A great feature I missed from Civ 5. Uh, we can also see your legacies, where you'll assign those legacy points, uh, and graphs. I love a good graph, so more graphs are always welcome. Uh, once you've sorted that out, you go to this screen, where you get to pick your culture. So this is quite extensive, uh, much less restrictive than some previous images may have applied, where you get maybe three choices. Uh, some here are locked off because they don't fit geographically, or you didn't meet the requirements, but either way, it's a lot here. Specifically, if we count the dots on this screen, there seems to be 11 choices to pick from in the Exploration Age, but this is all work in progress, so keep that in mind. Now let's take a look at this screen, uh, showing off the Normans. There's a lot to unpack here. The UI looks very rough, but again, they've had to try and obscure a bunch of stuff, so they're not ready to reveal uh, everything here, so take it with a few grains of salt. Uh, on the right here, we can see what this culture choice will unlock for you in general. So picking the Normans will unlock, by default, the French Empire in the modern age, as well as something else that is hidden. Uh, down the bottom, we have these checkboxes where you can play as Greece, Rome, or another hidden Civ. This was really confusingly laid out, in my opinion, so I thought this was giving you the choice to now play as some sort of Greek-Norman hybrid. Uh, but no. So in this example, they had already picked Rome in the Antiquity Age. These checkboxes are showing the requirements to pick this culture. So to become the Normans, you have to have been playing as either Greece, Rome, or that third in Civ. I think this is confusing because they, they're checkboxes, which typically you want to tick them all off. Uh, I think the other ones should really be faded out or something, but anyway, it's a minor nitpick. You don't have to fill out all of those requirements. On the left, we have the Normans abilities. So they're classified as being diplomatic and militaristic, which is an interesting combo. Um, and their abilities are that land units receive plus one movement when embarked, and land units adjacent to coast receive plus five combat strength. They also receive plus 30% production towards constructing the White Tower, which I assume is the wonder native to the Normans. Every Civ has one, and that is theirs. Uh, moving back to the age transition stuff, this screen showcases the moment where you spend your legacy points that you earned in the past age. I'll throw some pictures on, on screen here with some of the effects. You can also see some special legacies that you can slot in there that cost nothing. Uh, and they're kind of for flavour, but you can change your capital to your new culture's capital. Uh, nice touch, with some interesting gameplay implications, considering that the palace moves with it as well. Uh, onto pantheons, only in the Antiquity Age. So pantheons are only in the Antiquity Age, religion comes into play in the Exploration Age. Uh, but they showcased uh, Moria's unique ability, is that they get to select two pantheons upon unlocking mysticism which seems really strong at face value. Uh, so I'll showcase some of the pantheons here. You've got the usual suspects, the usual sorts of bonuses we've come to expect. Also mentioned before, but yes, Greece was revealed on this stream as an antiquity era civ. Uh, they are mainly focused around culture and diplomacy, so no real surprises here, but go check out all the information on the newly updated game guide page. I'll link it down below. Uh, there was a few interesting tidbits that were revealed at the very end of the stream. So you can no longer capture settlers. If a military unit moves over a settler unit, it is instantly destroyed. So you're still incentivized to do this to set your opponents back, but it's no longer quite as insane if you manage to pull it off. A bit of detail is also given about roads. Uh, roads are automatically built back to your capital if it's within a certain distance. Uh, Carl said it was around 10 tiles, but it's not exactly the, the number. Um, there's also a merchant unit that is used to create trade routes. So when a land trade route is created, it automatically builds a road between those cities. And the merchant uh, also has an ability to build a road manually, a bit like a builder, which is a very strange design choice, really, considering that they wanted to get rid of builders and that micromanagement aspect. I can't help but feel people are going to build merchants and put them to work, building roads everywhere manually with them, which definitely doesn't feel like its intended purpose, if I understood what was being said correctly there. 
They finished off the stream with the official first look for Hatshepsut, uh, and these are being done by the same lady that did the Civ 6 ones, Sarah Lynn. Very nice. So a bit of a long one today, team. That's all I've got for you today. If I've missed anything, please let me know. Please let me know in the comments down below. Uh, I'll see you all tomorrow. But until then, thanks for watching.